Hello, dear student. Here I am again, your professor, Dr. Carver. We are learning really an easy way to um, to gain new knowledge and educate ourselves how um, the, uh, about the anatomy and the physiology of uh, all our organ systems. And today we are going to talk, we talk already about the digestive system, urinary system, nervous system, um, lymphatic system, immune system. Uh, endocrine system. So today we are going to focus on the reproductive system and educate ourselves on how to have a healthy reproductive system. Reproductive system uh, does not uh, function continuously like uh, other uh, organ system, all those systems that I just mentioned earlier. It does not function in continuously like them. It, they get, uh, they, they, they does not become active until the puber, uh, puberty. And the uh, male and female are productive organs are quite different, but they share the same four tasks. I will tell you what are those four tasks. They form specialized cells that we call gametes, all right? Uh, sperm for the male and egg or ova for the female. They bring the gamut and uh, uh, the, the, those gametes together, and uh, so the sperm uh, uh, intercross the, during the sexual intercross, especially if sexual reproductions, the sperm uh, fuse with uh, the egg during intercross or copulations. They combine and form. Uh, they combine their genetic information because the sperm is bringing genetic information. The eggs have our own genetic information. So they combine those genetic information contained uh, within those gametes through what we call fertilization and form what we call zygote. Zygote is an egg fertilized by the sperm. Zygote. So it's the first cell that it will be the new uh, uh, origin for to give a new individual of all the body cells arise from it, all our body, all right? Uh, then the four and the last task that they share is to support the development of the fetus during the gestations and the, and the birth of the baby during the parturitions. The reproductive uh, system is very, very sensitive to hormonal secretions. So is the under influences of uh, the hypothalamus, the pituitary uh, gland. So they form like an axis uh, from the hypothalamus, pituitary gland affecting also the gonads, the gonad that they are testes for male and ovaries for female. So they form what we call hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Gonad for testis, or if it's male, ovaries if it's female. So the, um, so we refer uh, to this regu uh, regulations of um, by the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. They involve interacting hormones uh, such as uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone uh, testos, uh, testosterone inhibiting hormone, uh, I mean uh, FSH, which is the follicle stimulating hormone, and luteinizine hormone, LH. Um, the gonadotropin is released from the anterior uh, pituitary, and uh, the gonado. Um, uh, tropin, uh, it's released uh, and the, G, the gonadotropin releasing hormone is released actually via the hypothalamus rich to uh, uh, anterior pituitary via, if you remember these connections, it's the hypophysial portal system. We study all this there in the endocrine system. It's just a, a reminder. So um, the six hormones, I want you to get uh, to know that the six hormones for male are the testosterone. Estrogen and progesterone are for female. They act at the target cells in the body. Exerts, um, and they can also control their own production. So we have 
this um, uh, physiological feedback, which is the uh, negative feedback uh, that will come to regulate their own secretions at the level either the hypothalamus or uh, at the uh, pituitary uh, gland. So, so yeah, so we have the hypothalamus that secrete this uh, um, gonadotropin release hormone, right? He will go through this uh, via the portal hypophysial uh, portal system, reach the anterior pituitary, all right? And the anterior pituitary, therefore, answer by releasing uh, those, uh, we call that uh, gonado uh, hormones, LH for uh, lithinizing hormone and FH for follicle stimulating hormones that will actually stimulate the gonad, either testicles or ovaries. And as a response, we will have the sex hormone. If it's testis, we have the testosterone. If it's ovaries, we have estrogen and progesterone that will um, act on the target uh, uh, cells. And uh, of course, the progesterone and testosterone and estrogen act as a negative uh, feedback, uh, either uh, to control their own productions uh, by negative feedback, either at the level of hypothalamus, uh, stopping the productions of the gonadotropin releasing hormone or at the anterior pituitary uh, gland uh, stopping the release of LH and FSH. We have also another uh, hormone which is the uh, inhibin. Inhibin it's released from the gonad from the gonad uh, to uh, uh, from both male and female. And there exists also a negative effect uh, on the uh, anterior pituitary. The inhibin, it's released and exerts uh, a negative effect on the uh, pituitary to stop the LH and the FSH. Uh, so uh, what you got over here, uh, solid oils are for stimulations and anything that is um, not solid oral, this is for inhibitions all right so this is so um if you remember how the the sperms and the the eggs are being produced they produced by six year um, or productions um division that we call meiosis you remember that right meiosis so any cells in our body somatic cells that they are not sexual they divide um, uh, via mitosis for genosex um, except uh, sexual cells they divide uh, through meiosis there are big difference between mitosis and meiosis this is just a quick reminder of that uh, meiosis give um, uh, four haploid cells from diploid cells we got four haploid cells that they are not identical to the original cells and they are not identical to each other uh, either uh, and this is because of the independent assortment and the crossing over that happened during the prophase one one we have two stages under meiosis we have meiosis one that um, will separate the chromosome homologue that's the final product for it and uh, they give me two identical, uh, two non-identical cells, all right? Uh, uh, and then this non-identical cells go through the meiosis two to give us four. In the end, we will get four haploid cells that they are not identical to each other, not identical to the origin uh, cells. So from the fluid, we got four happy with cells non-identical to each other not identical to the original cells mitosis however they give two identical cells to each other and identical to the origin cells so the fluid stay the fluid here the fluid become happy with so this is how we form uh, uh, how the sexual um, uh, cells divide those ovaries and those testicles okay um so let's start with the part one
and we are going to stay quite um, a time um, looking at the anatomy for this. Uh, we start with the male, a reproductive organ, and this is a sagittal view in this uh, slide. So we have, uh, the, we need to start by this organ or the gonad that produce the, the male sperms. And we have the testis. The testis is within this uh, pocket that we call scrotum. All right. So we have the testis um, that's produced. So we have the testis. All right. This is where the sperms are produced and they are, are, are delivered to the body uh, through a sper system uh, duct. And then the system duct is formed by the epidemis. All right. From the epidemis, uh, we go through the uh, the dictus uh, different. From the dictus different to the ejaculatory uh, duct, uh, from the ejac ejac uh, sorry, I have a hard time talking this morning. Ejaculatory duct. to the erythra. From the epidemis, right? To the dictus deferens, to the ejaculatory duct, and then to the erythra. We have also accessory uh, sex gland. Uh, we have the seminal uh, gland, the prostate, seminal gland, the prostate, And this little uh, bins over here shape, it's the billable erythral gland. The scrotum is like a sac that is um, hanging outside of the abdominal, abdominal pelvic um, cavity. It contain um, a pair of testes. It's very important to lower in um, the temperature. They are always three degrees Celsius lower than the core body temperature. And lowering the temperature uh, by this uh, scrotum is very important uh, for uh, sperm predictions. And I, I moved to this slide because I want to show you those uh, scrotum. All right, and you have here, they are divided. Uh, this is the midline septum that divides the scrotum in two compartments, one for each testis. Uh, scrotum is very sensitive by the temperature change. When it's called, the testes are pulled closer to the warm um, uh, body wall. And uh, we have very important muscles that um, the, the play a role on, on, um, on pulling those testes. We have the cremaster muscle. Those cremaster muscle, it's band of skeletal muscle that elevate the testis. And we have the dartus muscle. 
the dartos muscles in layer of smooth is smooth. This one is skeletal, and this one is smooth. Is um, very superficial um, that uh, wrinkles the skin. I And each test is surrounded by two tunics. We have um, tunica vaginalis that is derived from, it's the outer layer that derived from the peritoneum. And we have the tunica albigini. This is the inner layer that form uh, fibrous capsules. You can see it here in this slide, very good. And the tinica albigina and the tinica vaginalis, the outer inner layer. The inner layer, this outer layer. Um, Uh, what else I can tell over here? We have some lobules. See those yellow things? That's lobules. We have like 200, almost 250 lobules uh, for HTCs, and each one contain um, one to four seminiferous, um, those little yellowish things over here, seminiferous tubules. All right. And they are separated, um, they are separated by uh, those symptoms. So those symptoms separate those lobules, and each lobule contain uh, they are like 200, almost, uh, I mean, uh, 250 lobules per test, per test. Um, and they have uh, each, each lobule contain a similar uh, ferrous lobules, those yellow thing, and those are the site of the sperm productions. So if the, this is the site of the sperm production, the sperm is conveyed then from the seminal ferrous tubules to um, straight. We have also straight tubules. You see, this is straight tubules. It's like um, straight tubules, they branch into the seminiferous tubules. So this is producing sperm, they convide them to the straight tubes, those over here. And they convide them after that to do great testes. This little brownish structures over here. And then after that, they reach the epidemis. So from the test to the epidemis, but exactly from where in the test is, it's from the seminiferous um, uh, tubules to the striate tubule to the efferent, uh, to the, uh, sorry, to the red testis. Then, oh, sorry, before to reach the epidemis, they go through how they reach the epidemis is through the efferent dictal. Those efferent dictal, you see, it's very tiny. Then after that, the epidemis, <coughs> sorry. The epidemis, um, if you look at it, uh, we have a um, body of the epidemis and we have a tail 
and of course we are going to have a head. So head of the uh, epidemis, body, and tail. The sperm are stored in the tail until ejaculation. So now let's look at them. Um, we are going to focus on those um, seminophyros tubules, on their histology. The tubules consist of a thick stratified epithelium surrounding a central um, lemon filled uh, with fluid. And we have four important uh, type of cells. We have the cystonosis cells that they are large um, if you look at their histology they look columnar so they are large columnar cells that act as supporting cells and play a role in the sperm uh, formations we have spermatogenic cells the cells that surrounded by those uh, uh, columnar cells so we have those columnar cells they surround they are surrounding those uh, spermatogenic cells they, they are gave rise to the sperms and uh, we have uh, milweed cells milweed cells this is uh, smooth mm, smooth like muscles the surround seminoferous tubules that uh, contract uh, to squeeze the sperm and uh, testicular fluid through the tubules and then we have this interstitial endocrine cells this is um kind of like Leydig cells, they are the ones that will produce androgen and some estrogen. Interstitial endocrine cells. So now we are going to talk about the blood supply for um, uh, the testes. So, testicular, uh, this, uh, sorry, Testic, uh, testicular arteries are rising from the abdominal aorta. This is this testicular uh, vein are um, are rising from. Uh, uh, let me pronounce it correctly. Pampiniform venous plexus that surround they are surrounding actually each um, testicular arteries. All right. Remember this that have to keep color it can produce sperms. All right. So this is very nice because uh, they absorbs the heat those uh, uh, testicular arteries and those uh, that they are surrounded by this pampiniform venous plexus. They are, uh, uh, they are going to absorb the heat from testicular arteries and keep the testis cool, cooler. And then, uh, I, like, I, like, I like this one because this one shows exactly that the spermatic cord is enclosing a lot of, um, if you see those yellow things, that's nerves. So the those nerve fibers, those yellow, and also those blue and red, they are uh, blood vessels. Uh, I don't see, they are also lymphatic vessels. I don't see green, but they are. There are also some lymphatic vessels that supply the testes. So the accessory gland that carry the sperm to the tissues are uh, to the body exteriors are the epidemis, the dictus deferens, ejaculatory duct, and the urethra. So let's focus on the urethra uh, and the epidemis. We, we, we see it, right? Uh, the epidemis have the head, body, the tail, the sperm stay there until ejaculations. <coughs> let's focus on the urethra. Um, not only conduct the semen, um, conduct the urine too, but at a different time. He is not conducting semen and uh, 
and sperm in the same times at different times. They have uh, three regions. If you look at it, you have some region that it's between the prostate. So we call that prostatic erythra. That's the prostatic erythra. Don't know if I have a better picture. Um, yeah, I do. So we have prostatic erythra. And we have the intermediate. This is the intermediate um, part of the erythra. This is uh, Membranor's erythra over here. And this is in the aerogenital uh, diaphragm. And we have the spongy erythra that run through the penis and open at the external erythral of orifice. The penis, that's the male uh, copulatory organ, is consists of the root and the shaft, which is the body, and end at the glands penis. The purpose or foreskin, it's a calf of, um, it's like a calf and it's a loose skin uh, covering the glands. And uh, during the circumcision, this is what uh, will move. And uh, science, scientific um, proof, the science proved that 60% of the male that they are. Uh, been, uh, they have this uh, purpose to move uh, circumcised. Uh, they are uh, a high, a lower risk to develop uh, some um, uh, disease such as HIV and uh, reduce also the the effect for other reproductive uh, infections. Uh, we have like 60% of uh, circumcised males in the United States. Internally, the penis is made of um, spongy erythra. And three cylindrical uh, bodies um, that they are actually uh, erectile tissue. They are uh, a spongy network of connective tissue that um, and smooth muscles with vascular uh, spaces. We have the corpus or uh, corpora carvinosa that is paradorsal erectile body and we have the corpus spongi spongi spongiosum which is around the erythra and expand form glands and the bulbs for the penis The seminal glands, they are, uh, that's the bladder, by the way, right? So they are posterior on the bladder surface. They are on the posterior part, those uh, seminal glands. They contain um, 
uh, smooth muscles that contract during the ejaculations and produce uh, viscous alkaline seminal fluid. Um, they are very rich on fructose, citric acid, coagulating enzyme uh, such as vesiculase, prostaglandins. It's, um, it's yellowish pigment that can even fluoresce uh, under UV light. And they, contain, they comprise almost 70% of the volume of the semen. Uh, the duct for the seminal gland joined the dictus to end the dictus um, different to form the ejaculatory <coughs> to form the ejaculatory duct. So they join together to form this ejaculatory duct. Then we have um, the other accessory gland, uh, the prostate, right? The encircle the erythra, if you see it, they are around the erythra. It's the size of um, peach pit. Consists of a smooth muscle that contract during ejaculation. We have a lot of smooth muscles here. Um, they secrete milky, slightly acid fluid. They contain citrate, enzyme, prostate-specific antigen, the PSA. Uh, play a role in the sperm activations, yes, and and uh, and uh, we have, and you you will see it. It's encircled the erythra. It's make up almost uh, one third of the semen volume. The other seventy percent um, is made uh, by the. Uh, the 70 percent of the volume of the semen is by the seminal glands. So after that, we have those little pea-sized um, size glands inferior to the prostate. This is the bilbo-erythral gland. They produce thick, clear mucus during sexual arousal. And their job is to lubricate the glands uh, penis and neutralize the uh, trace of acidic urine in the erythra. Uh, I just want information about, um, very quick about the semen. The semen is a milky, as I said, is a milky uh, white mixture of sperm and uh, accessory, those prostate and uh, seminal uh, uh, and seminal glands secretions. Uh, one of them makes 70%, the other one third. Uh, they are almost uh, uh, two to five uh, milliliter seminar ejaculated containing 20 to 100 million sperm per milliliter. They contain ATP, for the, they, contain, um, they contain fructose for the ATP productions. Uh, they protect and activate sperm, facilitate sperm movement. Um, he, he neutralized the acidity, and if I, you remember, I told you those pea size. Those bilbo erythral glands, uh, not only they lubricate the gland's penis, but they neutralize also the acidic urine in the erythra. So the alkaline fluid here neutralizes the acidity of the male erythra because he pee from there, and also the female vagina and enhance uh, motility. Now we're going to move to the part two of this um, lecture, which is the physiological um, 
physiology of uh, this reproductive, the male reproductive system. system. So <clears throat> as a function, of course, erections, enlargement and stiffening of the penis, ejaculations, proportions of the semen from the Malbec system, and also productions of the gametes form, forming those gametes, the, the, those sperms. We call that spermatogenesis that happen, if you remember, in the seminiferous tubules, began at the puberty around the age of 14. Um, I told you that the reproductive system become active after puberty. Um, adult male produce almost 90 million sperms uh, daily. So let's talk about the first um, the, the, the spermatogenesis, how the sperms are formed, right? So it uh, <clears throat> before birth, um, the male um, uh, infant has um, testosterone level two thirds of the adult. So uh, the after birth, the are rise in they start being uh, going up, right? Until they reach the puberty, the high level of testosterone are required to suppress the the. to establish this adult pattern, the sexual adult pattern. So how the spermatogenesis um, happen? I said, I mean, the production of the sperms happen in the seminiferous tubules of the testis. Uh, spermatogenic cells uh, give rise to the sperm. Uh, we have stem cells, which is the original cells, which is the spermatogenome, which is the fluid cells. They go through um, mitosis first, uh, producing uh, uh, two, uh, when you go to mitosis, it produce two type of uh, cells. We have type A cells, it's uh, romine in the basal lamina as uh, precursor cells, and we have a type B uh, cells. Type B cells grow. And is the one that will enter the meiosis and move to the abdominal compartment. And will, uh, when he gets a grow, he will give what we call the primary spermatocyte. This primary spermatocyte is the one that will go through the sexual division, which is the meiosis. So, of course, meiosis, meiosis one, meiosis two, they will produce four haploid spermatide cells. And those spermatide cells, during a process called spermiogenesis, they become sperms. Okay. So I already told you that um, I just say that uh, before birth. Uh, Male infant has testosterone levels, so this is red over here representing this diagram is representing sperm productions and the testosterone level, uh, uh, depending on the age in the male. So we have, um, you see before, uh, before, this is fertilization, so this is before birth and after birth puberty and adult side. So before birth, male infant has testosterone level almost two thirds of the adult. Look at that, almost. After birth, brief rise in the early infancy, after birth, brief rise. And he remained low during all the childhood. 
So it, it seems like before birth, it's a rise to determine the sex of the kid that is a male. After birth, it's a slightly high because he's going to uh, help actually developing the secondary um, a sexual characteristic of this male. And then after that, he stays, he stays low until they reach the age of 14, which is the puberty. As the puberty nears, the high level of testosterone are required to suppress actually. Uh, remember this uh, hypothalamic uh, uh, releasing of gonadotropin? An adult pattern is established. So they have some negative feedback happening over here, right? The balance um, and end the puberty, uh, the kids start um, producing sperm. The amount of testosterone and the uh, and the uh, sperm produced by testis affect the balance. Uh, interacting hormones of the HPG, of the hypothalamic uh, pituitary uh, testis axis. It, the balance take almost, uh, let me see, uh, three to three and a half years to achieve, after which the testosterone and sperm productions are fairly stable through the life. They become very stable through the life. And without this uh, gonadotropin uh, releasing hormone and the gonadotropin, which is the FSH and LH, the tests the testicular can dysfunctions can become atrophic. Uh, the, and the sperm and testosterone productions can uh, decrease. No need to remind you that testosterone, um, if uh, we remember very well, it's synthesized from uh, cholesterol. It's the derivative of the cholesterol. It's transformed at some target cells. It's converted to um, a molecule that we call dehydrotestosterone, DHT, in the prostate, and it's radial in some membrane neurons. It promotes, of course, spermatogenesis the productions of sperms, and target all accessory organs as multiple, multiple uh, uh, productions effect. So they have what we call anabolic effect through the body. The deficiency, we talk about it, they can cause atrophy of um, the testis, the testicles, uh, some accessory organ, semen, semen volume can decline, and erections and ejaculations uh, become impaired uh, uh, and uh, for treatment we have to give those um, uh, patients some testosterone injections to replace that deficiency. Uh, of course it's responsible to the male secondary sex characteristic um, which induce, um, we call it secondary because it is not directly involved in the reproductive. It's non reproductive organs that uh, they are, uh, the target, uh, the testosterone can target the development of this secondary sex characteristic non reproductive organs like the appearance of the pubic, axillary, and facial hair the enhance and the growth of the hair on the chest and other area. Uh, if you remember, if you you can notice that the, the, the kids when at the puberty, these boys change because the larynx enlargements cause the, the, the pinning of the voice. Skin become thicker and become oily. Bones grow, increase in density. Skeletal muscle increase in size and mass. Um, uh, they boost also the basal metabolic rate and uh, 
also is the sexo drive, the basic sexo drive uh, uh, for the male. We are going to move to the third part of this lecture, which is the female reproductive system. So we will do the same things. We will talk about the anatomy, then we will move to the physiological uh, or the function of the reproductive uh, system. Reproductive um, uh, of the female is more complex because of the pregnancy. It's the male that carry the baby. So the female glands, we call them ovaries. They produce female gametes. We call that egg or ova. They secrete six hormones, estrogen, estradiol, estron, estriol, or this is different names for estrogen, and the progesterone. We have an internal uh, genitalia that is localized in the pelvic cavity. Actually, um, all right. And we have also external genitalia, this external genitalia. Uh, that is the external um, uh, sex organs. Uh, the internal genitalia we have um, uh, include ovaries, right? Anything that is inside the pelvic cavity, we call it internal. Anything that is outside, outside of the pelvic cavity, we call it external. So he include the internal, include the ovaries, include the duct system, that is the uterine tube, the uterus. Sorry, we have the uterus, the ovary. And the vagina. The ovaries, they are paired structures. We have left and right ovaries. They are um, paired structure flank of the uterus. They have like an arm on the form, those ovaries. So let me show you this picture. They are exactly like an almond form shape. Each ovaries is uh, held in place by ligament. We have the ovarian ligament attached to the uterus. Look at that. We have um, the suspensory ligament that um, attach to the the suspensory ligament look at it that's the ovary suspensory ligament that will attach the ovary laterally to the pelvic wall and we have the mesovarium the mesovarium ligament that suspend suspends the ovaries the suspensory uh, ligament and the mesovarium are part of what we call broad a uh, ligament, broad ligament that supports our uh, uterine tube, uterus, and the vagina. We focus on the ovaries, that's the histology of the ovaries. Each um, uh, ovary is surrounded by fibrous um, tunica albigina, which is then uh, covered by germinal cuboidal epithelium. This, um, this, um, germinal epithelium is uh, in continuity with the peritoneum. The, 
The ovaries has uh, outer cortex that has forming gametes and inner medulla that contain large blood vessels and nerves. And ovarian follicles at different stage of development. Ovarian uh, follicles, they are like tiny, tiny sac-like structures in the cortex. Um, it contain, they are in the medulla, but they are embedded in the, in the, Sorry, they are embedded in the cortex. That's the cortex. Sorry, sorry. So the medulla, it contains large blood vessels and nerves. That's the medulla. I, I know I, I, um, I got um, a little confused over here. So those ovarian follicles contain immature egg. They can contain uh, the ocytes, immature egg that... Uh, uh, on case by one or more liars at very different uh, uh, stages. Each month, um, the follicle uh, gets ripened and eject the ulcers in the event that we call ovulations. The blood supply, uh, if you look at it, we have ovaries, uh, arteries that branch from the abdominal aorta and ovarian branch of the uterine arteries. So we have these ovarian blood vessels that they are coming from the suspensory ovary. And also we have them through the mesovarium. The female duct system, uh, we have the uterine tube. We have the uterus and the vagina. The uterine tube. Let's focus on the uterine tube. It's also called a fallopian tube or oviduct. You receive the ovulated osis. And this is usually where the fertilizations happen. It's very long. Each tube is about uh, four inch long and extend from the area of the ovary to the superior region of the uterus, the ovary to the superior region of the uh, uterus. We have the amphibidum, which is a funnel tape uh, shape opening at the peritoneal cavity. We have some extensions over here that we call the fembri. fembri. We have the ampulla, which form half of the uterine tube lymph, the ampulla. This is where the fertilizations happen. And we have the stini very close to the uterus. This is the very narrow. If you look at it, it's getting from large and getting very, very um, uh, narrow over here. That's what we call estimus. Est Esthmus. Esthmus is a narrow medial third that empty into the superolateral uh, region of the uterus. During ovulations, see, you go from the ovary, right? So during the ovulations, uh, the uterine tube captures the osset. 
and if the herring is firm, he will be firm, uh, fertilized uh, in the ampulla. And uh, And those uh, febri, they are going to stiffen and sweep ovarian surface, creating current that will carry the oocyte into the, the, the tube. The oocyte is uh, carried along toward the uterus by smooth muscle, a movement that we call, uh, you remember what is it, the, this, the, the distal movement. Uh, we call that peristalsis movement. And also some ciliary actions for the ciliated cells that exist there. You will have moved the oocyte into the uh, iterus. Non-ciliated cells of the tube will function as uh, nourishing uh, the oocyte and the sperm that is uh, there. Focus now on the iterus. It's a holothec uh, wall muscular organ. Uh, we have the body of the iterus. We have the, the body of the iterus. We have the fundus. We don't call it a head. Um, we call it fundus, and we have the, it's large, it's become very narrow over here, this narrow region, we call it the isthmus. Don't confuse it with the isthmus of the uh, fallopinian tube. The isthmus, it's iterine isthmus, now it's inferior. So the fundus is the superior part, the thymus is the inferior part. And then we have the cervix, the cervical uh, cervix is the narrow neck that uh, projects into the vag vagina. So, of course, we have the He communicates with the vagina through a cervical canal. We have also over here some cervical glands that will um, secret mucus that blocks the sperm entry except during the, the mid uh, cycle. So it's hollow muscles, so he is made the wall on, um, we have the is supported also by a uh, ligament. So let's look at those ligaments. We have the round uh, ligament that's bent the iterus to the anterior wall. We will come back to the wall of the iterus later. Those ligaments. We have also the aerosarcal ligament that secure uh, the ligament, the iterus to the, uh, to the sacrum. And we have those um, cardinal ligaments that uh, from the cervix, they're coming from the cervix, uh, and the superior uh, vagina. So this is from the cervix and the superior part of the vagina to the pelvic lateral wall. We have them in both sides. Those are transverse, um, uh, I mean, cardinal ligaments or transverse uh, cervical uh, ligament. So 
so they are from the cervix and the, and the superior part of the vagina to secure it to the pelvic, to, to attach it to the pelvic lateral wall. So the heterocircal is to the uterus to the sacrum, right? The round ligament, it is to the anterior wall. Cardinal ligament to the pelvic lateral wall. The uterine wall, as you can see over here, is made of three layers. We have the endometrium, which is um, endometrium, which is a mucosal lining. It's a simple columnar epithelium on the top uh, of a thick, very thick lamina propria. Uh, the fertilized eggs borrow uh, this endometrium part. It's so thick that he borrow it. Uh, and reside there during the development. We have also the myometrium. The myometrium is uh, consisting of interacting layers of smooth muscles. They contract uh, rhythmically during childbirth. And we have the perimetrium, which is the outer uh, serous layer, or what we call visceral uh, peritoneum. And so you have those um, so let's look at the histology now of the endometrium if you remember it's mucosal lining simple columnar in the top of large lamina propria and this is where uh, the fertilized egg hide uh, in uh, reside during the development so we have this large lamina um, propria with this uterine gland. And this is, it doesn't show it very big, but this is the sample columnar uh, epithelium layer, large, epith large lamina over here, which is a um, uh, connective tissue with a lot of uh, uterine gland. So if you look at it, um, the histology of the endometrium, we recognize uh, uh, two chef uh, uh, or layers of strata. We have the stratum functionalis. We have the basal uh, layer or the stratum basalis. The stratum um, uh, functionalis which is uh, the top of the endometrium, right? Included this uh, mucosal epithelium, which is columnar. He changed in response to ovarian hormone cycles, and he sheed during demonstrations. Puff, gun, during our female's period time or most demonstrations. The stratum basalis, which is the basal layer, formed a new stratum functionalis after each menstruation. And he's not a response to any uh, ovarian hormone. This one answer to the ovarian hormones. This one now. Okay, making myself clear over here. Trying to. So let's look at now the blood supply for this um, uh, endometrium. It's um, the blood supply is very important because it plays a role during the cyclic changes especially that we have this basalis functionalis that sheet after each menstruation, and we have the basalis uh, that will renew this uh, functionalis at each menstruation. So we have uterine arteries, uterine arteries that will, um, is in the myometrium, it branch into radial um, uh, uterine arteries, branch into, um, Radial uh, etrian arteries actually arise from where? You remember, it's from the internal iliac uh, uh, artery. Any branch into 
accurate artery in myometrium, accurate artery branch into, you get the radial artery in the endometrium. So from the myometrium, we enter the endometrium, and this a radial artery branch into straight arteries, right? Straight artery. And we have those kind of like very funny looking. It's like sparer, spiral arteries. Those spiral arteries um, will go into the functional func stratum or layer. The straight artery uh, serve the basal layer and do not degenerate. Those of course degenerate because the functionalis uh, shed every menstruations, right? And uh, that's caused uh, spasm uh, uh, during the menstruations. This is when some, uh, during the period, we, as the females, we got a lot of spasm and pain. Okay. Now we move into the other organ um, system. This is a mid sagittal section, and we are going to talk about the a vagina. The vagina is a um, ten wall the tube, right? Uh, three to four inch, um, eight to ten centimeters long in a lump. Functions as birth canal, passageway for menstrual flow and organ for. Uh, uh, copulations and extend between the bladder and the rectum from the cervix to the exterior. The urethra, this is a big difference between male and female. The urethra run in parallel with the vagina anteriorly. The vagina secretions is very acidic in adult female, but alkaline in adolescent. Um, the, the mucosa near the vaginal um, orifice form an incomplete partition that we call human that ruptures with the intercourse. The vaginal, we have two um, fornix. We have anterior fornix, it's anterior, and we have a posterior fornix, which is the upper end of the vagina surrounding the cervix. That's the cervix for the uterus. We finished with the internal uh, genitalia. No, we are going to talk about the external genitalia, the, the also called the vulva or pedon dom. They include, uh, you have the list over here, the mons um, pubis, fatty, it's very fatty area, overlying the pubic symphysis. We have the labia majoris, Measure, and we have the. Uh, I like to see it in this picture. We have the labia major and the labia minors. 
which is um, skin fold uh, that uh, lie within the labia major. The labia major, um, it's covered with the hair. As I said, it's a fatty skin fold. And the equivalent of it in the male is the scrotum, the equivalent for the major uh, labia. It's the scrotum. Uh, the vestibules. And we have this ridge formed by joining the posterior uh, vestibules with the labia minora. We call that the foreshed. Trying to see if I have a better picture. No, that's the best. So we have um, this uh, flank vaginal opening that is uh, that releases mucus into the vestibule for uh, lubrification. So we call that the greater vestibular gland. That's the equivalent for um, the bulbo erythral glands for the male. Those little teeny uh, P shape over here. Uh, here we call that greater vestibular gland. We have the anterior parts of the vestibules. It's the uh, clitoris. And the clitoris, we have. Uh, the glands for the Clark Tyrus, which is, which is the exposed portion. And we have the body of clock craters that contain the corpusa carbinosa. The glands, and we have the Purpose for the clitoris that it's like a hood. It's like a hood glance. That's the clitoris, the exposed part of the clitoris, which is the glands. Then that's the purpose of the clitoris, and this is like a hood. And it does have some erectile tissue over here. Uh, it corresponds. Uh, For the, 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 the male is the penis that you. 
we have also the bulbs um, of the vestibules. Greater vestibules, the bulbs for the vestibules. Let's lie on each side along, um, uh, I mean, in each side of the orifice and uh, that engorge with blood during sexual stimulations. We move to another external organ, a productive organ, which is the mammary gland. The mammary gland are present in both male and female, but normally function only in a female. They are the main functions, of course, of male to nourish newborns. They have a sweet gland, but they are modified sweet gland. We are consisting of those lobes of the air. They are 15 to 25 slopes. We have this areola.
Oh, sorry about that. Um, I'm getting problem with the internet over here. So the next, uh, as I just said, I don't know where I stop, but we stop talking. Uh, we stop at uh, when we're talking about this other external uh, genital uh, organ, which is the mammary gland. The mammary gland are present in both male and female, but normally functional only in female. And the abdomen functions on milk. You could use nourish to, to nourish the newborn. They have what we call the modified sweat gland that consists of the lobules. We have like 15, those little tiny things that they have like a grab like. We will come back to this. This is what we call alveoli. So we have those lobules, 15 to 20 lobules. And we have this areola. Areola is pigmented skin that surrounds the nipples. And we have those tiny yellow, the white things over here. This is um, suspensory ligament that attach the breast to the underlying muscles. The lobules within the lobes, they contain glandular alveoli. That's where you see seen over here. Those alveoli, they are the one that produce uh, uh, milk. The milk passes uh, from the laciferous duct, all right? So the milk passes from the laciferous duct which the laciferous sinus and then he go outside. So he's producing this alveoli go to the lastiferous duct, the sinus, the lastiferous sinus, then reach outside through the nipple, nipples. In non-nursing uh, women, the glandular structures is really undeveloped. So well, let's talk about some um, physiology of the female reproductive system. As we speak about the spermatogenesis, we talk about the oogenesis, which is the, how those eggs, those ova, are produced. So um, this little very complex, not only because the woman is the one that's carried the baby because of the pregnancy, and um, also is the way those eggs are produced, quite a lot of differences. But remember, they go through also meiosis to produce four uh, haploid cells, not identical to each other, not identical to the original cells. So the ovarian, let's focus on the follicle development. The ovarian follicle is the functional unit uh, of the ovary. It is enclosed a single oocyte uh, surrounded by uh, pre-granulosa um, uh, layers of cells. All right. And uh, granulosa uh, and also some granulosa cells. They are uh, those granulosa cells can be more than one layer present. So the follicle go through different stages of development. They go from primordial follicles that's only single layers of those uh, squamous pre granulosa cells are surrounding the primary oocyte. That's the oocyte over here. Okay, you see the a little nucleus inside. So that's an oocyte over here. All right. So this uh, follicle go to a different sites. We have primordial uh, follicle that is surrounded only by one layer of squamous free uh, granulosa cells. Then the primordial follicle give uh, uh, develop into primary uh, follicles that have a single of cupoidal. It's not squamous anymore. It's cupoidal granulosa cells that is going to surround those oocytes. Then the secondary follicles have multiple layers of granulosa cells surrounding the primary oocytes. And then after that, uh, it will develop into antral follicle or vesicular vo follicles or tertiary follicle. It's not shown here, but I will show it later on. So it's uh, developed, uh, you have uh, 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 the offset, of course, you still have the offset, but now he develop a fluid filled cavity that we call the antrum. Before ovulations, the primary offset 
uh, is inside the vesicular, vesicular follicle, it resumes the meiosis and becomes secondary offset. We will go back to this event later. So this is secondary developing into the antral. It developed this uh, uh, antral um, uh, sac uh, fluid, full of fluid. Before ovulations, the primary ocet reside inside of the vesic uh, vesicular uh, follicles. and resumes meiosis and becomes secondary offset. So I'll go back to this picture. So now I'm going to talk about the oogenesis predictions of the female gamete. So we have um, diploid stem cells that we call uh, ogenia that by mitosis produce um, primary oocyte, so identical to the original cells, diploid, primary oocyte that undergo meiosis, one, to produce um, uh, uh, meiosis become, but it's it's a stop, it's uh, going to produce um, uh, The secondary acid that undergo the meiosis two to produce the ova. So the primary acid, the meiosis began, but it stopped, and it will resume after. It will stop exactly at the prophase one. The primary acid the stop at the prophase one. And uh, during this time, I mean, the ocean is takes years to complete. The inside this primordial um, follicles, they develop. If you see it, it's before birth. They develop even at the fetal stage. The follicles have two, um, I would say, two fates. Um, we have a program cell that we call that at, uh, atresia, uh, which is the apoptosis, so program cell that of the osset and the surrounding tissue. Uh, I mean, almost, I would say, 100% only, 0.1% of the cells uh, of the those uh, uh, follicles are going to be recreated. 99.9% of the follicles are never going to be recreated. Ovulations happen each month after puberty. And uh, only selected uh, few primary ocets are activated. And this is, is caused by high level of hormonal level, especially the follicular stimulating hormone, the FSH. Uh, and one of, of from this group that is selected, it will become the dominant uh, follicles. The dominant uh, follicle resumed the meiosis just before uh, ovulations. And after the meiosis one, In the ovulations happen to the life, right? After um, it will redeem the meiosis one. After division of the meiosis one is complete, we obtain. Um, let me show you in this picture. We obtain, and this happened from the puberty to the min, uh, menopause. Uh, meiosis one will uh, start, right? So after it's finished, we will obtain two haploid cells, no problem. But they are not equal in size. Different sizes are produced. We have 
position of the first polar uh, body that is smaller than the cells and is almost devoid uh, of the cytoplasm. And we have the secondary offset large cells with almost all the mother cell cytoplasm and organelle. All right. The secondary offset uh, get again arrested um, in the during the meiosis two now. And this is will be arrested at the metaphase two, and they will wait if there are any intercourse, if there are any sperm, not intercourse, if the sperm penetrate those offset. If the sperm penetrate those offset, then it will resume to finish his, um, I mean, the meiosis two. So it's really quite um, uh, complicated over here, but very easy to understand. All right before birth, um, the meiosis won't stop at the uh, prophase one. After, from the puberty uh, to the menopause, it will start the meiosis too, but it stop again at the metaphase, producing two unequal cells. The secondary offset will stop at the metaphase two until if it's uh, fertilized by sperm. So once it's, uh, if the sperm penetrates, second offset quickly complete the meiosis too, and he will produce the ovum, large cells with enough cytoplasm to nourish. Um, once he becomes this ovum, now the sperm can completely go in and produce the zygote. The secondary, <laughs> and we produce secondary polar bodies. They are bodies that they are small cells lacking uh, cytoplasm and uh, degenerate and uh, they died after. So yeah, there is uh, quite differences between spermatogenesis and versus oogenesis. So um, the male, uh, the total time to produce one gamete is about 74 days. For the females, we have from the puberty until the menopause, which is usually between 13 to 15 to 50 years. Um, lucky the male occurrence during the lifetime, it's happened from the puberty to the old age. I mean, he will continue producing unless some problem like, um, uh, I mean, ablation of the prostate or something's happened, then he will produce sperms all his lifetime. The females, it began in fetal life and end in the menopause. The number of gametes by meiosis, it's four equal sizes sperms. And by uh, females, is one large ovum and two to three small, uh, smaller polar body. So the pre uh, predictions of the primary offset happen only in the fetal stage for the females. The primary offset meiosis one is arrested uh, uh, at the prophase one, but resume only years later at the puberty. Secondary offset meiosis is stopped at the metaphase two and resume only if they are uh, complete fertilizations. So stage of development of the follicle development. So we are going to go by numbers over here. So uh, primordial follicle become primary follicles number one to two. Uh, primordial follicles is squamous like cells around their primary offset become cobuidal, right? and the offset on large process can take about one year to happen the follicle is now called primary uh, step two the offset secrete glycoprotein rich substance that form the zona pellucida that unclaps the offset and becomes secondary follicle stage three because these pregnanulosa follicle cells proliferate, forming stratified cobuidal epithelium around the offset. When more than one layer of the cells are present, follicular cells are called granulosa cells now. And this primary follicle now is called secondary follicle, step three. The granulosa cells and the offset guide um, one another development via the gap uh, connection, so they intercommunicate with each other and connective tissue and granulosa cells condense to form what we call theca, theca folliculi, theca folliculi, see that? 
those theca folliculi. So now this uh, secondary follicle will become uh, um, theca follicular, which is an early uh, vesicular uh, follicle. All right. A liquid will start accumulated between the granulosa and the cell forming early vesicular follicles. So this starts um, coming in. The antrum, which is a large cavity that is formed when all the fluid is um, uh, coalesces. So we have here a pre antral vesicle and now we have an antral vesicle which big antrum cavity full of fluid that's antrum see it start forming those antrum so this is like an early vesicular vesicular follicle or pre antral follicle all right and they form this tech around the tech folliculi so this is an antrum now we have a mature vesicular follicle. The osset is uh, complete, uh, the meiosis one, ready to be ovulated. So now we have the osset that is stopped, and we have here the zona pellucida, if you remember. So we have now the osset stop at the prophase one, All right? So this uh, antrum continue to expand with the fluid isolating the offset. It continue to expand. It isolates completely the offset um, from. Uh, it isolates completely the offset when the folic um, uh, isolate the offset with the surrounding granulosa cells, and this we call that corona radiata. The corona um, receives the develop until he completely isolates the osset with the surrounding granulosa. And we call it now, this part that's around the secondary osset, we call it corona radiata. It sits on the stalk on one side of the follicle. When the follicle is fully is full size, um, it's built from the external ovary. It's ready to be ovulated now. The secondary osset. After the osset and the corona are completely rejected, uh, ejected out, and uh, not rejected, ejected uh, from uh, here, um, or lying aside. Uh, of the follicle, uh, the rupture the uh, follicle that is stay behind uh, transform into glandular structure that we call it le, le corpus litum. Uh, it's yellowish form. So this is why in French we call it le corps jaune, jaune for yellowish color, corpus litum. That's step six. I mean, um, the follicle and offset may take nearly a year to mature before ovulations can happen. The maturation process into phase, uh, phases, there are two important phases. We have uh, uh, the gonadotropin dependent, independent phases. This is the pre antral phase involved the antrafollicular uh, paracrine. Uh, and then we have the antral phases. 
I mean, to develop this antral phases, we need this uh, gonadotropin hormone, the FSH and LH. Uh, the dominant uh, follicle is selected, and the primary ocet uh, resumes uh, her uh, meiosis 1. And he will stop at meiosis 2 until fertilization. Um, the ovarian cycle, uh, we all know that uh, the main of it days is like it happened monthly, every 28 days, um, series of events uh, associated with maturations of the egg. They are uh, during this phases, this is where we have those uh, uh, follicular phases that happen and lithial phase that happen. And we have, uh, so, So we have those. Um, I, I, need, I, need, I need something quick. We have we have those. We have those um, two consistency phases that happen with the ovulations during occurring mid cycles between the phases. We have the follicular phase that happen. Um, uh, that will develop this vesicular follicle that we saw earlier between day 1 and 14. Then after 14 days, the ovulations, but between we have the lithial phase. I mean, after that, sorry, after this uh, ovulation, we have the lithial phase, which is the period to produce this corpus lithium, this uh, le corps jaune uh, activity. So if uh, the, the sperm is here, because the offset now is ready to be fertilized, he will fertilize it. Uh, the 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 asset. Only 10 to 15 women, unfortunately, have this 28 day cycles. I mean, it's very uh, even their ovulation. Some women may have ovulations, and some every month. Some of them have it every three months. It depends. Um, The ovulations The ovulations uh, uh, is during the ovulations. I mean, uh, war ruptures experience secondary effects that is uh, now surrounded by the corona radiata uh, into the peri uh, perinatal cavity. Um,
The, the follicular phase, uh, several vestibular on-trial follicles become sensitive to those uh, endotropin hormones, the FSH, and are stimulated to grow. Uh, one dominant follicle become uh, specially sensitive to FSH. The FSH, all this, you remember, all this is to be able to develop this lateral um, corpus, this uh, Le Corps Jaune, this one that we saw over here, right? So it's just I'm repeating myself over here. So uh, the dominant follicles out complete other follicle and it's only when to continue on other non-dominant follicles will undergo the the dead program cells, uh, right? Uh, the atresia, the primary oocyte of the dominant uh, follicles complete the meiosis one to form the secondary oocyte. Ovulations, if sperm is there and get fecunded, it will uh, uh, cause um, uh, the, it will resume the secondary uh, meiosis. Um, And why it will stop at the meiosis too if they have no fertilization? Because the granulosa cells will send a signal causing to stop this uh, uh, the the meiosis uh, one. So after ovulations, uh, we have a rupture of the follicles. The antrum is filled with clotted blood, referred to as uh, corpus hemorrhagicum, they would eventually be absorbed. So the Romanian granulosa cells and internal lethal cells enlarge to form the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum secretes progesterone and some estrogen. If no pregnancy happens, uh, the corpus degenerates into corpus albicam, uh, which is a scar in 10 days. And that's how we see it over here in this stage uh, 7. Over here, that's the corpus over here. That's the corpus albicans. If pregnancy happened, the corpus luteum produce hormone that uh, will help this pregnancy until the placenta can take effect. Uh, and it's about take about um, uh, three months. All right. Of course, um, the ovarian cycle is under um, uh, hormonal, uh, uh, this hypothalamus, uh, uh, pit, uh, anterior pituitary uh, axis uh, control. So before puberty, ovary secretes small amount of estrogen. Um, let's And the estrogen inhibit the hypothalamus release of the gonadotropin releasing hormone. As the puberty happens, uh, if leptin levels are adequate, the hypothalamus becomes less uh, sensitive to the estrogen. So he does not, the estrogen will never going to stop him. He will start releasing this gonadotropin releasing hormones. And this uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone will secrete the FSH and LH by the pituitary, and then acts on the ovaries um, organ. The event will continue until we achieve and uh, uh, until uh, menarche uh, happens. So the hormonal interactions during the ovary and the gonadotropin stimulate the FSH and LH secretion, the FSH and LH will stimulate the follicle to grow, mature, and secrete uh, sexual hormones, right? estrogens.
And uh, the way you see it's really very nice. Let's stop here very a uh, little bit. So we have the um, LH will the LH um, the surge of the LH will. Um, will uh, trigger the primary acid to complete meiosis uh, one to um if you look at it over here to complete meiosis and to become acid secondary acid then the secondary acid will enter the meiosis to continue uh, and will stop and uh, in the metaphase too, right? Until if it's got um, uh, fecunded or fertilized by the sperm, then it will resume the meiosis too. The FSH uh, stimulates, um, if you look at it, it will act in the, those granulosa cells. And when he stimulates the granulosa cells, he will release estrogen. He will release estrogen, so which is the LH2. Uh, but the LH will act on the tickle uh, cells of the follicle to release the estrogen. So those uh, granulosa cells uh, and also the androgen, tickle cells, then the androgen, then the tickle cells. The granulosa are uh, to produce the androgens, uh, which granulosa converts, the granulosa will convert into estrogens. High level of estrogen trigger the release of the stores uh, LH and FSH by the anterior pituitary at the mid uh, cycle. The LH also stimulates other uh, uh, events that lead to the ovulation, such as uh, local vascular permeability, trigger inflammatory response that promote release of metalloprotein as enzymes that uh, weaken the ovarian wall, so stop the bleed flow to produce follicle wall, causing the wall to be thin, bulge and rupture, forming a hole. The oocyte with corona uh, radiata exit ac accomplishing the, the ovulations. The estrogen level will continue to rise as release continue released by the dominant follicles. When the level reach a high level, a brief positive feedback happen on the brain and the anterior pituitary trigger the LH to release. So this is like a positive feedback because he's going to increase the productions of the estrogen. It will trigger the estrogen, will trigger the LH, it will continue producing more estrogen. Increasing a level of the plasma estrogen level, it can exert not only a positive feedback via the LH, triggering the LH surge, but it can also trigger a negative feedback by uh, uh, inhibition in both, in the FSH and the LH, because he can interact on the anterior herpes uh, pituitary gland and also in the uh, uh, in the hypothalamus by blocking the product. This is the negative inhibitions by blocking the gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus and by blocking FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary gland. The inhibin 
the inhibin over here by the granulosa released by granulosa cells can also block the protections of the FSH by the anterior pituitary gland. Another um, negative feedback came from rising the plasma of the progesterone, not only the estrogen, but also by the progesterone. The progesterone inhibits the LH and FSH release pituitary gland and all by the so let's look at these correlations uh, between the anterior pituitary and ovarian hormones that we just look on the structural change of the ovary and the uterus. What's happened? This is hormonal. Now let's look at those changes in the ovaries and the uterus. During this menstrual um, cycle, I mean, the uterine menstrual cycle, there are a series of changes in the endometrium that happen in response of, uh, to those hormonal levels. So there are three phases. We have day one to five, that's the menstrual phase. And day, day six to 14, that's the proliferative phase. This is pre-ovulatory phase. And then we have the post-ovulatory phase that happened between, remember that cycle is 28 days. So we're using this as a reference, okay? But only 15 to 20% of women in the world have this 28 days. Some of them have 30, some of them have less, um, depend on the woman. So we, but we all go through those three phases, the menstrual phase, the proliferative pre-ovulatory phase and the post-ovulatory phase, 15 to 28 days. So let's look at all those changes. Menstrual phase, the one to five. Ovarian hormones are at the lowest level. Menstrual phase, this uh, sky blue here, over here, light blue, light blue. So the ovarian uh, hormones are the uh, lowest level. The gonadotropin, a level are beginning to rise, those LH and FSH, they start. Lowest level of the ovarian hormones, the gonadotropin start to be rising. Stratum, uh, function, function, uh, stratum functional is detached from the uterine wall and is a cheat. It's a cheated. That's the functional layer, that's the basal layer. C is completely gone. By day five, the growing ovarian follicles start to produce more estrogen. Start producing estrogen. Okay. Day, day six to fourteen, which is the proliferative area, which is this um, more blue area over here, what we saw. Estrogen level is higher. It's getting higher level. And that's, let's look at what he's doing to the endometrium. He starts making new, forming this functionalist um, layer.
And you even see that the layer thickness and the gland enlarge. And you will see some spiral uh, arteries increase in number. Remember, the spiral arteries are the ones that they are in functionalis uh, uh, layer. And um, because of the oestrogen is higher, is getting higher, is arising, he also increased sensitize of progesterone receptor in the endometrium. And this is by um, sensitizing this um, progesterone receptors. Uh, I mean, it's in out um, the cervical mucus um, becomes sticky. Uh, if the herini sperm come in, he will facilitate the passage. The ovulations for this normal cycle happen at the 14 days. After uh, this ovulation, which is the post ovulatory phase, which is the secretory phase, this is the most consistent in durations. Uh, the endometrium prepare for embryo to be implanted. The progesterone, if you see it, is getting up. This is the green phase over here. That's the secretory phase. Uh, the oestrogen also is getting up. The endometrial glands are bigger, enlarged, and secrete nutrients into the internal cavities. The thickened mucus is forming the mucus uh, plaque that block entry for more sperm, a pathogen, or debris. Shortly after ovulation, if you look at it, shortly after ovulation, what you see in Bobo the oestrogen, he got level decline completely. And what's happening for the LH, they are at their peak. LH and FSH, they are at their peak or higher. And what's happened uh, in, the, uh, in the ovarian uh, cycle over here? You see that the LH transform rupture follicular into the corpus shown. See the LH, what he done? Into the corpus shown. The LH stimulates the corpus shown to secrete progesterone. This is why my progesterone is high over here. And some estrogen almost immediately. This is why it starts having. And the progesterone help maintain the stratum functionalis. Why uh, and maintain also um, the the pregnancy if the pregnancy happen. If no fertilizations, what happened to the corpus um, John? It degenerates when the LH start to go down to fall. So we will go through what we call program cell death apoptosis. Let's look at the effects of the uh, some estrogen and progesterone. Um, so the estrogen promote the oogenesis, follicle growth in ovaries, exerts a lot of productions, anabolic effects on the female reproductive tract, support rapid short life uh, growth, sport and to puberty, and use the sexual um, secondary sex characteristic growth of the breast, increase of deposit of, of fat, especially in the the breasts, the breasts are big if they have a lot of fat and hips and uh, widening and uh, lightening of the pelvis. The estrogen has also a metabolic effects as, uh, such as maintaining a low uh, total blood cholesterol and facilitate the calcium uptake. 
the progesterone specifically promote the change in the cervical uh, mucus, affect the placental uh, progesterone during uh, pregnancy, uh, inhibit the uterine motility and help prepare uh, breast for lactations. That's um, You have to know that an ovulated egg can enter the pelvic cavity. So infectious agent can also enter the pelvic cavity and cause pelvic uh, inflammation if an uh, egg can enter the pelvic cavity. So is some, um, uh, some infectious uh, agents. Uh, and uh, those uh, waving long finger-like projections from Bray, uh, they can pull uh, this into uh, the egg into the uterine tube. So that stop our uh, lecture for today. Hope that um, uh, everything is fine. Stay safe. And uh, again, if you have any questions, never hesitate.